Hello, everybody. Welcome to Carly's Couch. Except today, it is Alexia's Couch. <laughs> Actually, I'll probably take the, uh, I should take the picture and scratch out your name for this one. Hey, it's Chrissy. Um, appreciate you guys listening, as always. We hope you're still enjoying the podcast. We appreciate um, everybody's comments and your engagement. And we want to encourage you to continue to leave reviews. We appreciate Please. them. Um, Y'all loyal. Y'all real ones. I want to do all the Cali ad libs. Y'all the best. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, and just feel free to reach out to us anytime. Like you can email us. Te- mm, I almost said text us. Don't do that. <laughs> you can email us. Uh, hit us on social media. All that good stuff. We also yeah. have um, a comment box like on the website. So if you ever have topic yeah, under ideas, episodes, I'll be seeing too when people leave comments and uh-huh. stuff right there. So and we reply. You always YouTube. copies me every time I no, do something. No, I'm not. You just did both legs. Jesus Christ! <laughs> and then you put yours. It's up. mirror neurons. Okay. Okay. Mind your business. Alrighty. <laughs> Um, today, see how this gonna go. <laughs> today I'm interviewing Carly as our guest for this episode so we can learn more about you. So thanks for being here. You're welcome. Um, first, I just want to start by asking you about your like life growing up, just kind of to set the scene. Um, where, where did you grow up and like what was that like growing up for you? I am from Oklahoma originally, so I grew up in Midwest City, M-Dub. Uh, see, see, see. So <laughs> it's like maybe one or two people from Midwest City to listen to the podcast, but they gon' they gonna fail me though. Believe me, mm-hmm. you gonna fail me. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma. I was born in California, and as I'm an adult, I'm like, Mom, you really thought that was the best idea? But mm-hmm. um, her, my dad, my father weren't together, and so she moved back to Oklahoma, where she's from, and that's where I was raised. And you just want to know generally, like, what it was like growing up. Mm-hmm. Like, what was your like home like like? Um. My home life, my home life was tumultuous. I guess is a good a good adjective for that. Um, for a while, it was just my mom and I, and it was like amazing. And my mom was like the cool the cool aunt who like did all the stuff. Mm-hmm. We would always do all the everything at my house with all my cousins and all the holidays. Like she would take us to go see the movies. Like it was my mom that did everything. But then she um, married my stepfather. Well, met my stepfather and then married my stepfather, and they had a very chaotic relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, he was very physically abusive to her and verbally abusive and emotionally abusive. And they they both turned into alcoholics. So it was a lot going on. Did you consider your stepfather your dad? Like, did you call him dad or? Um, not then. I called him by his first name. How old were you at that point? Like when he came into the picture? I was four. Okay. So you four were five. young. Yeah, I was young. Um, and I wanted to ask you about your parents. And, that, and that's why I said, do you call him dad? Because I don't know if you would include him if I said to talk about your parents. Mm. Um, but tell me about your parents. Like, what were they like? Like, your, you said your father or well, your mom moved away mm-hmm. from where your dad was. So, like, what kind of person was your dad? Or did you even know if you were that young? Oh, I didn't know. I didn't meet my dad till I was 23. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so I didn't, I had no idea. Mm-hmm. In my head, I had one picture of him and mm-hmm. me when he was holding me when I was a baby. So I knew what he looked like, and I knew he was Filipino. But... In Oklahoma, there's 90 Filipino people, so I didn't know what that meant or what mm-hmm. that looked like. Um, and, yeah, so I had no idea about my dad, only what my mom told me. Uh, my mom is super, super sweet, very big-hearted, like, loves to give and give back to people. She's always the person that everybody goes to for everything that holds the family down. She's the youngest of six, and so she is just that person. She's very outgoing, and, like, she can make friends anywhere with anybody and she's really great with the people that usually don't like people like the people who are real standoffish the people who don't like to talk to other people you are like think about it like if you're in a classroom and like the kid who's always acting out and acting crazy that the teacher can't get to calm down Mm -hmm. that's my mama's best friend and she will somehow like you'll leave the room for five minutes come back and she'll be be able to have like them chilling playing a game with her like nothing ever happened Mm -hmm. and so she's just that type of person were they young when they had you or like nah, they were parents. 28 and 29. Oh, okay. So they were older. Well, I say well, older. Like a lot of people's parents. Like, I oh, guess like when they 20s. had you? Yeah, you when saying? they had me, they were 28 oh, or 29. Okay. okay. Well, because when you're talking about like that cool mom, you know, sometimes it's like a younger mom or something and that's why yeah. it's like easier to hang out. Um, so if your dad was Filipino, what is your mom? My mom is Native American and white and my dad's Filipino and Polynesian, but I didn't learn that until way later in life that he was also poly. So growing up, did you feel like you had any identity issues or kind of any confusion around that? I did, because um, I was really 
I was a lot more brown when I was little, like, I guess being outside and, mm-hmm. and I had really dark hair and dark eyes and like my family, a lot of them are real blonde and blue eyes. And I would ask my grandma, like, yo, like I would walk up to them and put my arm up next to them and I'd be like, why do I look different? Mm-hmm. And she'd be like, but you're not. And I'm like, but I am. And they're like, but you're not. And so I don't think that they have the depth of understanding to be able to help me relate to that because they couldn't relate to it and they didn't really understand. Like, even though we have some Native American on that side, like, it's decently far back and we're a little bit far removed. Whereas in my stepfather's family, they're brown just like me. Like, people used to think I was his daughter and then my mom was my stepmom. And people would ask, like, oh, your stepdaughter is so cute. She would curse them out. Like, she Who was is your stepdad? He's full-blood Native American. He's Chickasaw mm-hmm. and Choctaw. Mm-hmm. And so even though I don't know on my side, the Native American, I got to very much connect with the Native American on his side. Like my grandfather wore the big headdresses and I got mm-hmm. to go to the powwows with them. And my cousin, you you know, took her pictures, like very traditional. Like I got to see all that cool stuff growing up. And so I always identified a little bit more with that. But even part of me knew that that wasn't me, even though I was there, like part of it was. But I, it was hard to connect. Like I never connected with my white family like I always felt different or off um and yeah it was just kind of weird so I guess what box did did you check off in school other what do you do now other Mm -hmm. and like if it's like I'll I'll check because I wasn't sure if like Filipino was like Asian slash Pacific Islander and sometimes those aren't the same thing and like which one matters I I, yeah did you mixed race multiple races did you ask your mom about your dad or about your heritage like what was your journey understanding and learning about um, those things? I did. So I, I, my mom would always tell me I'm Filipino and I'd be real proud, mm. but I had no idea, no context of what that meant. And she didn't know enough about it to help me. And so what I did when I was little, like I was really, really proud about it. And I would always um, like collect Asian things because I was like, okay, well, I think Filipino it means Asian. And so like I would just, any mm. Asian thing, like I ha- my room was <laughs> so full of Chinese symbols and Japanese things and stuff that has nothing to do with the Philippines. <laughs> but in my head, like that was me trying to hold on to that part of my culture. I remember meeting my first Filipino person uh, when I was 14. I was first my first year, 13. and No, for 13 or 14. Anyways, I was my first year in public school. I was in eighth grade. And I like met him. They're like, oh, he's Filipino. And I was like, hi, I'm Filipino too. And he was, we were like walking to class and he was like, okay. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, all right, I'm going to go. I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. nice to meet you. I was like mad excited. <laughs> and he did not understand why. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even think he knows that he's still the first, first Filipino person I ever met. Do you feel like you missed out on anything as a child in your childhood? Um, missed out on anything? Oh. Do you feel like there are um, like experiences or anything that you missed out on? Well, I would have loved the opportunity to grow up like more with like my culture and like where I'm from, like being able to even know what that was. Because back mm-hmm. then, also we didn't have Google. Yeah, so yeah, you, <laughs> you know, I was really struggling a little bit. Like I was like looking in dictionary, mm-hmm. looking in history books, but there's jack squat about Mm. filipino people a lot of times and things and on the native side it's like if you don't know the exact tribe or the origin and in oklahoma that's where the trail of tears ended and so um if you were white passing a lot of times it was better to assimilate and not let people know that you were native and i think that's what happened in our family i don't know it just kind of got i was gonna say why haven't you mentioned whiteness about say oh no i I said my mom is white and yeah, but I mean, in like you trying to discover yourself, you're like, oh, I want to discover the Filipino and this and yeah. that. Like, oh, it's a lot of white. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, what about that? I didn't ever felt like I connected with it. It actually mm-hmm. wasn't recently until I started that journey. Like, mm-hmm. it was always, you know, me trying to learn more about the Filipino side, me trying to learn about like the poly side once I figured that out, me trying to learn more about the Native American side. And then, um, one somebody who I care about a lot in my life, like, kind of challenged me, like, dog, you white too, fam. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't like, yeah, but like I'm not like that white, but like you are white. And so um in business school, and let me preface this also with like I am in a traditionally black sorority, and that has always been the culture. Cause people be like, Well, you're a Delta. And I'm like, Yeah, I am. But that's like the culture I've always felt most at home. At, at most at what home. What is with, the culture? With like with black people, with black culture, mm-hmm. like as far back as I can remember, like that's always where I felt most mm-hmm. comfortable. Like I grew up in black churches. I used mm-hmm. to mime like that. Always my best friends, the people who like I lived my life with and mm-hmm. that I always felt most at home with. And as much as I love and appreciate that culture, it's not mine. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, you know, learning that balance of appreciation without appropriation and loving, but also realizing that's not me. So in business school, 
a lot of people would be like, man, Carly's not white. She's this and this. And my friend Stacey Ann would always be like, no, but she is white though. <laughs> and it's important that y'all realize that mm-hmm. she's white because there are genuine white people or half white people or whatever mm-hmm. out there. And by y'all not, you know, letting her own that part of herself, like you're taking away from who she is and how she shows up in spaces. Mm-hmm. And I used to not understand that until, like I said, someone in my life really challenged me to start exploring my whiteness and what that mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. And so that's been a journey like with the last couple of years. I was going to ask you about um, you being a part of your sorority and that do you, how do you feel about people of other races joining um, historically black fraternities and sororities? It's not my place to answer that question. I mean, like in real life, like it doesn't. If, really if that's your sorority, yeah. How, but how do you feel about a line of eight white girls oh, crossing? I wouldn't like that. Why? Because I feel like what I've seen happen a lot is people join it for the clout. Like they join it to be unique in these spaces. Like, for example, like being an Asian person and joining a sorority and being like hashtag Asian Reds and things mm-hmm. like that, you know, it's like you're unique and exotic in these spaces that weren't even like created for you. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the reason why, but they actually don't care on the back end about like why these soror- why these spaces had to be created in the first place or the struggle that black people actually go through. Mm-hmm. And so it's a lot of people doing it for clout and doing it to be seen and to be popular or to be cool, mm-hmm. but not really caring about the reason the sorority was founded, the reason that these things had to exist and the people that exist within them Mm -hmm. and their struggles every single day and not actually giving back to the cause. So it's like you want all the clout, but you don't want to do any of the work and you don't actually care. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I get bothered. And I think it's really hard because like I am one of these people in these spaces, but I, my heart and intentions are in the right place, but I've met a lot of people who are not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I agree because there are a lot of people, it's almost (sighs) like they self fetishize, however you say that themselves mm-hmm. kind of with it. Yeah. Um, but again, what if that eight people and you ask them and they didn't even know each other, you know what I mean? Like what if they were like, man, I'm really, I identify more with this group and I like this group the same way that you say. I don't know. It would just be weird because it's a traditionally black sorority. It would be but you're not black. It was <laughs> exactly. I know. So what are you talking about? <laughs> well, I, I'm not saying any of this stuff. What if, what if it was eight people just like you like on a line? I don't know. Uh, that's an interesting question. I'm not going to answer it because I don't actually mm-hmm. know how I feel about that, but it would be weird that, to have black spaces without black people. Yeah. Like that's awkward for me. Yeah. And I, um, and I just ask that cause I, I, I think that's just something that I think is interesting. Like period. When you talk about, well, we've created certain spaces because we didn't have opportunity elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Other people have opportunity to do things elsewhere. Um, why not join, uh, this other one or like they had the, uh, the Latinx ones now. I don't know if they have any Asian, like, yeah, they technically do. Thing. They and, probably do, right? Yep. And it's like, well, okay, if you're a white person, why not join your white sorority and then be a person who is an advocate still, but you're talking to these people. Exactly. And so what's interesting is I knew I wasn't about to join one of the white sororities at OU because I went to OU undergrad. I just knew, like, that wasn't even an option. Going in just because I'm the stereotypes a lot, but also just seeing it like that's not how I operate, that's not how I do things, Um and so, okay, I was like, okay, well, that's off the list. Um, mm-hmm. Oklahoma is mm-hmm. uh, the starting place, so pretty much the founding of a lot of the Native American sororities. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't Native enough, or I didn't feel Native enough to be in those. Mm-hmm. And then I went to the Asian things, and I saw them, and I was like, oh, I'm not Asian enough to be. Mm-hmm. Like, I just didn't feel comfortable. Like, it wasn't any part DST of is me. where you felt comfortable. It was. Like, I did a lot of research, a lot of praying about it. My guy, Eddie, mm-hmm. uh, is a Kappa. And, like, we talked a lot about those different things, and that's really where I felt the sisterhood. That's where mm-hmm. I felt the service and the pool, and so that's what I did. Yeah, I wanted to ask you why you chose to um, pledge or otherwise <laughs> Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Yeah. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> um, yeah, it's so, dry ass. Ooh, girl, that, that's flow. a little low key joint. <laughs> yeah, a little low key joint. You know, I'm working on some right, vocal cords. If you had did the real thing right now, I'd have been like, <laughs> I'm cutting that shit out. <laughs> and snip, snip. If you had went extra hand, I'd snip, have been snip. like, okay. <laughs> no, um, so I, I wanted to be a part of a sisterhood. So I'm an only child for my mom, mm-hmm. right? And so I'm only child for my mom. And I was like, okay, I want to join a sorority, but I want to join something that's real, something that's making a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, my guy daddy was like, oh man, you light skin, you should be okay. I was like, what? Mm-hmm. I didn't even know what that was. Mm-hmm. And so like I got to college and I was like, oh no. Like I remember I went to a yard show and I was like, that isn't, I called him and I was like, bro, that's not even mm-hmm. me. That's not even who I am. And then I saw 
um, all the events and all the stuff that the Kappa Alpha chapter was doing on campus, like the Deltas, like they ran everything. Like they were always doing service events, always doing things. Like I literally saw them moving and shaking the whole campus, like doing everything. Mm. Like big shout out to Crystal, one of my pro fights who just like was president of BSA, was doing like all of these things. And I was so inspired. I was like, yo, like that's what I'm working towards. Like I want to do mm-hmm. that. And then so... um asked a couple of questions and they were like, oh, read these books and start doing research around these things. So I did my research, ended up talking to a couple of people um, like in the sorority and was like, yo, like this is really what I want to be a part of. Mm-hmm. And when did you cross? Crossed in 2009. So it's <laughs> tw- it's 20, it's 10 years this year. Oh, this is your 10 years. Yes, my 10 you fall, year. spring, what? Uh, fall. I was going to that completely wrong. Oh, nine. So, fall 09. So when? When is your 10 year? December 5th. Oh, that's funny. Mine's the 15th. Hey, but right before 15. my birthday. No, I don't know how long. Whatever. When'd you cross? Um, 07. Um, 13. Huh? Or oh, 12. this year's 13? 12. Girl, you know my I'm math. like, hold on, let me add that's 12 plus That's why I just went on seven. past it. <laughs> um, are you active now? Or, and if not, do you wish to like participate? How do you feel about it now? Because a lot of times our, perce- not perceptions, but our thoughts about like Greek life and things that we did, you know, 10 years ago now mm-hmm. is kind of different. Do you feel differently yeah. about it? Um. I don't know if I feel differently. I'm still glad to be a part of the sisterhood and really mm-hmm. grateful for it. I am not active, not financially active. I do actually go to things like I taught yoga at an event. I did a Delta Gems thing. Like mm-hmm. I'm still volunteering, but I'm not an active in a chapter. I would like to be active, but then I'm also trying to think realistically like what that looks like with my schedule mm-hmm. and how I'm... Time. Yeah, and time-wise, like what that actually looks like and how can I bring my best self to all of these things at the same time? And I don't actually have an answer for that. I don't know mm-hmm. what that looks like yet. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, kind of talking about your friends and your networks, is there any commonality between the friends that you have? Like, is there something that about everybody that kind of ties them together and how they're friends with you or why, why you're friends with them? Yeah, I would say it's people's hearts. Like, I know that's a super Carly fluffy <laughs> I did not even mean to laugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it really, what does that mean? <laughs> it, it's, it's their, it's y'all because you're included in that, like, your heart, your spirit, and your drive. Like, it's just different things about different people, but it all ties into, like, who you are as a person, like, where you Mm want to go, and then your, like, how you move in life, Mm -hmm. and, like, your heart for the community and for other people. Like, if I literally look at all of my friends, y'all all all are motivated. Caring about other people. Yeah, like, caring about other people, caring about the community, but also Mm -hmm. trying to create a life that fits you and, and like really forging your own path. So I would say like your heart, but also people who are mm-hmm. making their own way and creating a life that they want to live very much so. That's a good answer. And as you're speaking, I kind of thought about the fact that I have a feeling, um, and I haven't thought too hard about it, but I have a feeling that that thing that we admire about our friends is because that's what we're actually either like trying to do mm-hmm. or, you know what I mean? Like, so I guess that's matched values, for example. Um, from what part of your life are your closest friends? Oh, um, all over. I don't. I guess mm-hmm. I don't have a space. Like I have a best friend from middle school. Mm-hmm. I have a best friend who from who wore, who's not. We weren't friends in mm-hmm. high school. We knew each other. We weren't friends. We got friends in undergrad. Best friend from grad school, and then a best friend from I guess right after I graduated. So it's like every phase of my life. Like mm-hmm. there is like there's four of them. Four like best friends. Who would you say your biggest fan is? My mom. Oh, that's like, nice. Uh, yeah. Like I mean, and you know, I I would like to like other people in my life are huge fans mm-hmm. and they support me very much. But boy, Carla, she goes hard for your girl. She mm-hmm. <laughs> she really loves me like nobody else in the whole wide world. How often do you communicate with um, your parents um, or your mom? I guess if that's what well, we're talking about right now. My mom, I probably it's kind of mm-hmm. we have seasons where we talk like every week, and then we mm-hmm. have seasons where I don't talk to her for a couple weeks, okay. just because if I don't have space, like I I can't because mm-hmm. it's um there is some requirement for like emotional space. Like, you know, mm-hmm. when I talk to her, sometimes like I want to be able to show up fully. And if not, I'll text her and she's like, hey, I love you. Hope you have a good day. Mm-hmm. But like not actually like talking to her. But I try to talk to her at least every week. Okay. Um, I want to move into like topics of like social justice and okay. like things that are going on. Um, and especially like with like how you've identified and and how you've had to figure that out a little bit more. How what do you would you say is your journey as far as like awareness and in a broad sense is that like I feel like we all were like yeah America as kids and then you're like oh you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. as you get older. So like what it, what was your journey of like awareness and you know understanding like this happens with brown people and black people and oh but these white people is different. Yeah. So. um it's interesting because growing up, you know, being white, but also not white passing necessarily, mm-hmm. like 
everybody in Oklahoma thinks I'm Mexican and mm-hmm. black, or they think I'm mixed. They have no idea what I am. Mm-hmm. And so it's interesting, but I grew up with my cousins who are very much white, white and like white, very white passing and stuff. And so they would do a lot of stuff like as kids that, you know, being white kids, they get away with. And when I'm, I'm this is all like, hindsight perspective mm-hmm. so they would just do all kinds of crazy stuff and be out there and like, my cousin made a potato gun and he was mm-hmm. firing that hoe towards the highway like mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying stuff like that and then the police came and they're like oh just don't do it again right but then when I would be hanging out with people from my apartments and we would get hemmed up for some nonsense for being on a college campus like uh, there's like this community college next to our apartment mm-hmm. complex the, the cops would like treat us so terrible she got hemmed up <laughs> <laughs> can y'all see Carla getting like <laughs> dragged wearing handcuffs <laughs> like 14 15 <laughs> But and and I just like notice the disparity in that. I'm like, mm-hmm. but my cousins do some like, cra- and the way they talk to authority, like with the way they even respond to them, is also very different. And I was just, I just started noticing. I couldn't understand why. Like, I d- it hadn't clicked yet. Like, I knew that there was racism. I knew those things existed, but I hadn't started noticing it in, p- in power structures. I was just aware of it, but couldn't put a name or anything to it. Can I stop you real quick just to say too, though? A lot of times, though. It's not even just race, but how you are raised and black kids are raised to be more like, you know what I mean? Like shy and more authority, respecting and things Mm -hmm. like that. And so if you were raised in a space that was very white, why would you say you weren't more? And maybe maybe you were, I don't know. But like, would you say or why weren't you more of in that same kind of vein or acting that same way where you felt like you could you know, say what you want and you know what I mean? Well, cause I did, I didn't though. Cause my mom, like I was very respectful, like mm-hmm. for authority. Like I was very much raised that mm-hmm. way. Like, so, like, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Like I was very, like she was like strict on how I treated people. It was more mm-hmm. so like treating people. Mm-hmm. And so I was always like really respectful. And, and I just noticed like disparities and how the feedback, not even just how we were responding to people, but also their feedback to us. Mm -hmm. But I would say like, as I've gotten older, like I've gotten much more like militant and more black and white in how things like, I I always want to see the best in everything and everybody. But like, you know, sometimes there's Mm -hmm. just not the best in things. Like people are like, Oh, this system is broken. And I'm like, it's not broken. It's doing exactly what it was set up to do. Yeah. Um, I feel like a huge shift was around Mike Brown. And when, when, everybody just started to talk more about Mm -hmm. certain things. Um, And there was like a lot of people who were protesting and like doing stuff like that, right? Was there any way that you say you, or is there any way that you say you protest or have protested or uh, kind of have worked in that area or done anything in that area to like protest like social justice? Yeah, I haven't organized. Like I've definitely, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't ever claim to be an organizer, Uh but like I definitely marched in like Mm -hmm. Mike Brown, like countless and it's sad, like Mm -hmm. like Eric Garner, like I I definitely was at all of those marches. After um, Mike Brown, it was like now every other, whatever, you know, somebody somebody was happening and it was getting coverage, which was what was making people more and more like organized things and marches and stuff like that. And I still, I still go to marches. I still think that they're Mm -hmm. important, but I'm, I try to think also like on a bigger scale, like what can I do? Mm -hmm. Like, how can I make an actual impact? Cause a lot of people's qualms with marching is like, it actually doesn't do anything. Well, you have to do something. And if all you can do is march then march and show up, but Mm -hmm. like on a broader scale, like I will do that. But also how can I use my privilege, which I'm like learning and understanding Mm -hmm. how to do it and showing up in these spaces but also making a difference and so I think about that a lot with my curriculum so I Mm -hmm. in my company I work with a lot of black and brown kids and Mm -hmm. kids from bottom quartile of income and below the poverty line and in lesser resource areas and so I think a lot about restorative justice and social emotional learning and how my programming like might not directly and well actually it does both indirectly indirectly address these things like we do talk about the systemic inequalities. We we do talk about breaking those down and how we can create our own things. But it's also like, how can I give them social and emotional tools and mindfulness tools to be like stress resiliency and the things that I know that they're going to face at some point. Mm -hmm. So I I think about that a lot in my curriculum. That's good. So you use your work as a way to um, then spread ideals and awareness through what you're doing Mm -hmm. and support. Yeah, and and just exposure, like Mm -hmm. learning how to put a name to something that you can't understand, Mm -hmm. like microaggressions, Mm -hmm. like things like that, like just helping them be able to understand. That's good. That's cool. Um, What do you believe spiritually? What are your spiritual beliefs? Um, That's broad, but probably for a reason. Well, for a lot of people, they'd be like, I'm a Christian. You know what I mean? So it's only broad to you because it must be intricate or complex. Yeah, it, it, it is complex. I grew up in the Bible Belt. Oklahoma's in the Bible Belt. And so I I am a Christian. I do 
believe in God. Um, I'm figuring out what that looks like without the confines of religion per se, Mm -hmm. because that's the only lens I ever had growing up. And so I'm figuring out what my relationship with God looks like um, and how that is every day. But I know that in all of my practices, so I meditate, I pray, I journal, I write affirmations, I do yoga when I run, like I listen to a lot of sermons. I think through a lot of faith. I do read the Bible Mm -hmm. a lot, but I don't, it's hard to self-identify as as a Christian. I I am, but it's really hard right now because of all the negativity and all the things that are tied to that. But are they? There's a lot of stigmas that tied onto being a Christian. Like I am a Christian, but I'm like figuring out what that means But why not be like, I'm a Christian. And so I'm an example. That's not that. And banding with other you know what I mean? People yeah, who are yeah, like no, that. that's what I'm saying. I still identify, but I'm mm-hmm. figuring out what that means for me, like outside of the construct. So, as a Christian, you believe in Jesus Christ and that He died for your sins and all of those things. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it's interesting, like having conversations with like my my roommate in business school was Muslim, mm-hmm. and we would have a lot of conversations <laughs> about the similarities and the differences in Islam and Christianity, mm-hmm. and talk to other people from like Buddhism. Like I, I like to read a lot and mm-hmm. study a lot about different religions and asking questions. And I think it's really interesting that there's so many similarities across the board, but discrepancies and like what the title of the person is. Like mm-hmm. Jesus existed in almost everybody else's religion, but is he the son of God is in only in Christianity versus in other places. And so why is that important to you? And what does that mean to you then? That per- Does that make you think like, oh, well, Mine isn't, might not be the whole thing or what does that make you think? Yeah, I never, I I think that learning more and understanding more helps me realize that my understanding and my piece in the universe is so small and that there, it is so vast. There are so many other things out there. Um, Dang, I really just lost my train of thought. I had something good, but um, that I might not have all the answers. And Mm -hmm. I think that's something that I'm learning as I get older. And that's why I'm more hesitant Mm -hmm. and thoughtful about how I answer these questions. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, like I am a Christian and I do like believe in that I do go to church and well, I'm I'm, I'm a Uh, bedside Baptist. I'm a bedside (laughs) Baptist at this moment. Um, Jokes aside. I guess when it comes to, to religion though, and, and conversations about it, I just find it interesting that it seems like now people can't say, or don't say I'm a Christian without feeling like they have to put that disclaimer on there. absolutely. And my understandings broadly of Christianity is that this is the way. Like, Jesus died for our sins, so these are things that I need to do, and I have to believe that to die and go to heaven and be with them, right? And so what does that mean to say, oh, well, this is similar, that's similar, cool, if that's what you believe, then that means you got you're doing this, this, and this to make it. But you know does what I mean? it? But can can all of these things not be true together? And that's what that's what mm. I'm trying to figure out. And that's why I don't think it's so black and white necessarily, mm. which is why I hate that it is portrayed like that. Mm. Like even so Oklahoma, um, being in the Bible belt, I remember I was taking like my minor was Spanish, and so mm. I was in this really high level Spanish class. And our professor was really good friends with somebody in the history department. And so he got us these like like we were able to go see these Bibles from like the 12th century and the 10th mm-hmm. century. So we got to see Bibles like as big as tables, like huge. And then we got to see little tiny ones, like when they mm-hmm. were burning them. And I'm also like thinking like even back then, so this was like 2010, 2011. And I was like, you know, Bibles have been rewritten and passed down all these t- all this time. And a lot of times it was like white men were the people over copying and writing down what these things are. And it's like, I started questioning like, well, what if they just decided to cut some shit out because it didn't fit them or their beliefs Mm -hmm. or they thought that it was wrong. And so I'm like starting to even think about how that stuff was passed down. And so the Bible we have now wasn't necessarily the stuff that was back then. So I've just been like researching and questioning a lot of it, probably Mm -hmm. more questioning now than researching, which Mm -hmm. I probably should change that while I'm trying to figure these things out. Mm -hmm. But even, even to a very base level. So if we're saying that, you know, being a Christian looks like this one thing or is these like, are these black and white rules? Like and what even if, even gray though, you know what I mean? There's still yeah. there's still certain aspects that, like Christ, Christianity. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what no, I mean? no, no, for sure, like for sure. Like he's, of he's it God's son, that he died you, on If it. you don't believe it, then that's not. What then you're you are. not a Christian. You know what yeah, I mean? Valid. So that's kind of like what I mean. Like there's certain things. It's like I believe they that they hung him on a cross that he rose in three days. You know what I mean? Like and that's that what you have back, to say. You believe. And that he's gonna come yeah. back for it. yeah. Yeah. So it's like, if do you really believe that or not? Are you afraid to say you're not a Christian? Mm. Are you afraid of the reason to to see the things or or to to I don't want to say admit as if it's like a bad thing, but like you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Would you 
would you would it be hard to be like, no, nah, I'm not a Christian? That would be hard for me. Mm-hmm. That would be hard for me. And I'm I'm figuring out why. Because it's like, you mm-hmm. know, if I believe these things, like, why it doesn't matter? Yeah, why do I feel like to? I need a caveat? Yeah, like, what is that? And I, it's like I do have very base black and white beliefs, and a lot of them are in alignment mm-hmm. with Christianity. Right, yeah. And I'm figuring out... And the, that's what's in alignment with multiple things when it's you're talking about the peace and love and, you know, the, the values. Yeah, a mm-hmm. lot of it for sure, but also, like, thinking about how, like, this affects... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a tough one. <laughs> um, if you could ask God something, what would you ask him? Oh, man. If God came down and was like, what's up, Carly? Well, what's up, Morgan Freeman <laughs> voice? Because um, in my head, that's what God sounds like. <laughs> um, oh, that's a good question. That is, because it's, it's weird because I feel like in our lives, <laughs> we have so many questions all day, every day. But then if you were like, ask a question... What you know what I mean? Like, what could you ask that would change something? Exactly. Or, That's exactly what I was thinking. But then it was really funny as I noticed my like need for confirmation and validation. Mm-hmm. I was like, Am I doing the right thing? Like, am I on the right path? But then, like, but then if it, depending on if he says yes then, or no, then, it's like, then what? Yeah. Then what? What if he says no? I'm like. Fuck that shit. I'm still going to do what I want to mm-hmm. do. You know what? What? What, what does that even change? That's yeah, why. But that's yeah. funny that that's the first thought that came to my mm-hmm. head. Um, that's interesting. No, you try to get validation from God. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> um, what do you think happens after you die? I don't know. Honestly, You're a Christian. You know what happens. Well, you go to heaven or hell. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if it's always that easy. I, I don't know. I actually don't okay. know. Okay. Do you believe in aliens? I think so. I think there are life forms out there. Mm. Do you believe in ghosts? Um. I do think spirits can have messages and things for us. Yes. Do I think they're like Casper and float around? No. <laughs> do you, um, oh, shit, I forgot what I was going to say. I was going to ask if you believe in something else and now I can't remember. Oh, do you believe like in angels and yeah. demon, like those types of forces being I here do. and all that? I do. You know, have you ever seen a ghost or seen an angel or seen anything like that? Mm. That you feel like you, you experienced or an a alien or anything? I haven't seen, um, but I've definitely had moments in my life like where I felt guided that felt like something supernatural like mm. was protecting me or was around me or what was different about that to make you feel that? Um, it, I, it's just a feeling like mm. I just like I don't know like it just kind of filled my spirit. That sounds weird, mm. but yeah, I don't know. It's just a feeling. Carly, what do you wish you were more comfortable doing? Mm. Um. On a very superficial level, I wish I was more comfortable, like, working out in just the sports bra and tights. Like, mm-hmm. that's a big thing for that's me. True. Like, whenever I do it. What do you wear? Don't you wear a shirt? I usually always have on a shirt. Oh, okay. I was yeah, like, just oh, like shit. A- Sorry. <laughs> Not a spill shit. Um, <laughs> um, okay. That, but I mean, on a on another level, like, just, I wish I was Which always, I like those types of answers, too, because it's like the real that's stuff. A real, that's some real shit. I also, I wish I was always 100% comfortable in being myself. Because it's, it's, I think... As an adult, I'm in mm-hmm. a constant thing of unlearning. And so mm-hmm. whether I've had like learned shame or fear or internalized stuff that people have told me about different things, mm-hmm. like I wish that I like all that stuff, like it's going away slowly and I'm like peeling off layers, but I wish I was just already there. What if, I always get to inception but what if being comfortable with ourselves is okay being uncomfortable? Like, Yeah, what if being uncomfortable sense? is part of being comfortable with Yeah, like that's part yourself? of it all. So it's like... Why are we always trying to feel like better about what it is when this is what it is? Exactly. I mean, that's the, that's or, the real enlightenment. That is, that's like, the enlightenment of it, right? Hmm. Is like that. It, it just kind of. So what, is. what what enlightenment mean? What, what would it mean if you were like comfortable or or like feeling like that? If you're comfortable being yourself, because that is you. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Technically, I already am. So it's almost like anytime you have that thought, be like. This is me. And, and I keep think moving. You, Maybe I don't know if that would help or not. Like I'm, I'm not an expert, but as I said, I think you asked me that before, though. So like, uh, why, sim- why? Yeah, yeah like something. Why similar. do you still feel like you have to do something do that something you're doing that you're already doing? Mm-hmm, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe because it doesn't look the way I want it to look or feel the mm-hmm. way I thought it would feel when I get there. Instead you, of just, do you have a perception what of what you should be and should be doing? Um, I want to say no and consciously awareness, but I there's a part of me that's still unlearning. But like, that's what's I, making you uncomfortable, isn't it? Yeah. That you're you may be feeling like there's this thing that I should be or something. Well, no, that's so I'm I'm unlearning that. I uh-huh. realize I unconsciously for a while now I'm very conscious of it. Had this perception that I always have to be 
happy and always have to be the person everybody goes to and always basically have mm-hmm. to be perfect. Mm-hmm. And so that was the dissension in me Which not most feeling people. comfortable, mm-hmm. right? Like I was like, man, like I'm not, sh- I'm not, I'm having a bad day. Like mm-hmm. I can't do this. I'm not a good role model anymore. Like for these kids and all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. But like I'm getting more comfortable with those things and trying to unlearn like the, I'm trying to let go of the need mm-hmm. to be perfect and the need to show up mm-hmm. a, and be this amazing. I mean, but I can be amazing and still have a bad day. I'm still trying to unlearn that. Mm-hmm. If that mm-hmm. made any sense. No, yeah, it does. <laughs> Have you ever had a cool um, idea or an invention idea? Man, when I was little, I used to try to invent all kinds of cool shit. Mm-hmm. I used to write songs. Man, I used to invent all kinds of dope shit. Um, not as of late. Like contraption type stuff? or All kinds of stuff. Something. Anything. Everything. Like what? Um, nothing that I remember. Or like an now. idea of like a time, like stuff you would like play with or something? Or? Well, I, that I would try to build. Like I would try to like, because I've always been into like building okay. things mm-hmm. and construction and things mm-hmm. like that. So... Like I was trying to build something that one time that would feed my fish. Like for mm-hmm. me, like, you know, like all these little things. So I mm-hmm. dream really big and do try to build things. I guess that's why I got into construction. If you left um, from here and got a scratch off and won $10 million today, Ooh. what would you do? Ooh. How, would, how would you, what would the rest of your day look like just today? Just today. So I leave here and go get a scratch off, figure out I win $10 million. First, I would just go after I got my money. Go get some really good food. Is that how they work? I don't know if that's how it works. It doesn't. But, but like, like regardless. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Regardless. That's cool. That's cool. It regardless. Because like, I'm thinking, like, who are you telling people? Who are you? Like, what are you? How are you acting? Um, how are you moving? I, like, even for maybe for the rest of the week, let's say. I just, you know, thank God. God, pray about it. Be excited. I would go. You're gonna eat. get ten million dollars. Pray. Huh? <laughs> I guess that should be a thing to do, but okay. yeah, I'd be grateful for it. Mm-hmm. I'll go get some food, like you mm-hmm. know, keep it to myself because sometimes it's nice to have. Well, that's just the first thing people who used to be broke all the time. If you used to be broke, like as soon as you get some bread, niggas always get some food. It's <laughs> <laughs> always splurged on a meal. Yeah, I would go get some good <laughs> food. Um, I would probably finish teaching today mm-hmm. and f- go like go coach because I have volleyball practice later. Go do all those things. Um, go get some food and then. You know, sleep and kind of pray about it and think about what I want to do and being very thoughtful with my money. Mm-hmm. And then I would probably start, uh, I need, would need to call a financial advisor at some point. But mm-hmm. um, then I would start, like, you know, telling my close, there's like a mm-hmm. group of maybe like less than 10 people who would mm-hmm. know for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you would also have to sign NDAs? Absolutely not. All right. I don't know anybody know I have $10 million. <laughs> but oh, that's right. We, what will be dope is because we have so much <coughs> stuff we're working on collectively, like mm-hmm. you and I, like me and Stacey, mm-hmm. and like you know, different things, like different things with different people. Like, yo, like we got some seed money, we can start mm-hmm. doing that shit. So, see I would have to happen. start reaching out to see how we can make that shit happen. That's cool. Um, let's talk a little bit more about emotions and feelings. Um, when in life have you felt most alone? Oh, um, two areas so. One, I would say, like, on the entrepreneurship journey, mm-hmm. like, especially in the beginning, it was really fucking hard um, because I don't, I didn't have anybody at the time who I could talk to who I felt like would understand what I'm going through. Mm-hmm. And so I, like, didn't know how to communicate, which is probably also why I was feeling lonely. So I didn't really know how to communicate what I was feeling. And so that in weird interim right after I graduated from B-School until, well, like, probably like a year up, like a year, just like trying to figure things out and not knowing, not having the questions, but not knowing how to communicate it, but also like closing the chapter from school and figuring out what I want to do. Like, it was like just a very lonely thing. And I think that's because I had to do everything by myself and for me, because nobody else can tell me how Mm -hmm. I need to do things for me or what I'm going to do. And then also on the journey, like at the time I didn't have a lot of people who were doing that. Like all my other friends were having jobs and doing other stuff. And so it was really hard to communicate. Why was it so difficult if you literally were just in business school and came out of business school? Why, why was what was the disconnect in learning all that, being around all those networks? You know what I mean, learning about business and then yeah. coming out and starting it. Um, not having any answers about like exactly what I wanted to do or the areas mm-hmm. I was going into. Like I was still figuring things out. Like I knew I didn't want to get a job. Like I not didn't want to get. I knew that getting a job wasn't the answer for me at the moment. Like I wanted to go into my company, but okay, but what does that look like? How do I narrow down my curriculum? Who do I need to talk to? Mm-hmm. But also just what did you learn in business school? Or like not not to like be like oh you didn't get anything but like what kind of stuff did were you learning a lot I mean I took a lot of entrepreneurship shit mm-hmm. but doing it and learning mm-hmm. about it are two totally different things so while you were in school 
it wasn't like you already had any ideas. Well, I did have an idea, but I didn't know how to do it. When you're doing things nobody's mm. ever done or nobody mm-hmm. you've ever known that has ever mm-hmm. done it and you don't have anybody to reach out to. Like I have friends who are mm-hmm. entrepreneurs, but they're not trying to get into schools mm-hmm. and they don't know how to write curriculum. Mm-hmm. And so, and also everybody, I felt like it was also um, a game time decision for me to do it when I don't have, like, I don't have a um, trust fund. I don't have like mm-hmm. family to donate $35,000 for me to start my business or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times reaching out to people, they'd be like, well, why are you doing this and not just getting a job? Right. And so, which also made it extra lonely. So it's like, I, it's like, you know, those things, but also what good are tools if you don't know how to use them? And so if I didn't know exactly where I was going, mm-hmm. I didn't know how to use all the resources I had at USC. I couldn't really move forward. So I was kind of in this weird interim when I was trying to figure that out. Mm-hmm. That was lonely. And what you said too, is there, was there another one you want to say? Or well, well, that I started thinking about, um, <coughs> so growing up, I'm, you know, an only child and like my mom was working like three jobs mm-hmm. and my stepdad was always mm-hmm. gone. And, you know, recently I realized like through therapy, like that's why I like being alone so much. Mm-hmm. It's because I grew up and I was literally by myself. Like I had to process and be by myself. Like I would get home and be my, by myself starting really early, like really, really young. And it's just mm-hmm. always been a thing, but I didn't realize I was lonely back then because I would like fill my time. But like now I'm like, no, I was like lonely and that's okay. Mm-hmm. But if you felt like you were lonely being by yourself as a child, now you're saying like you like being by yourself, you think? I, I do love you being know? by myself. Mm-hmm. I, I love being by myself. Um, it's just the best way for me to process and mm-hmm. download and think through things. Like my grandma used to say, only boring people get bored. Mm-hmm. I never get bored. And it's delightful. It's lovely. Like mm-hmm. it literally never happens. Um, so what's your happy place? Um. And a happy place looks different every day. Mm. A happy place is inside of me. Like anytime I'm taking care of myself and I am giving myself everything that I need, like I'm happy. Mm -hmm. But a couple moments that like jump up in my head is like, you know, sunshine, like being in nature, like exploring things, being with people that I love. Good food. Um, I'm going to close this out with you just with some overall like life stuff. Okay. Um, How has your life been different than you imagined? Man, I didn't know life could feel this good. I mm. didn't know I could, that I had the power within myself to create a life that I love mm. and that I want to live like that. My life doesn't have to look like anything I've ever seen and that I am literally basically the author of my fate. Like I know that sounds mm. corny, but in real life, like that every day I get to decide what my life looks like and work towards those things. Like I had no idea I could do that. And it's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Do you have a backup plan? No. Mm-hmm. Okay, because I'm kind of going as as life ebbs and flows. I'm ebbing mm-hmm. and flowing with it. Do you have any regrets that stand out? No, in your life, I don't. Okay. Um, and then the last thing that I was going to ask you, um, that you also asked me, is what are you proudest of in your life so far? Um, I'm proudest of my resolve, of my heart. Like I never quit. Like Mm -hmm. when things don't make sense, like I very much stick true to my vision and what I believe and what I feel, Mm -hmm. even when it logically is nonsensical and doesn't like, like I said, doesn't make sense. Not that's what nonsensical means, but, um, I could give up. I could have given up a long time ago and taken the easy way out to do Mm -hmm. things, but I feel so strongly and I show up for myself even when I don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's probably what I'm proudest of. That's good. That's, that's a really good quality because that's, Probably one of the top things that actually keep you going through things. Um, do we have a shout out this time? Um, I just, you know, because I'm, I'm Carly. So <laughs> I just want to shout out my team, like all the people that pour into me mm-hmm. on a daily, that my friends who love me, who check on me, who FaceTime me, who, you know, just really like think about me. Like y'all really make this a lot easier. Like mm-hmm. I could do it by myself, but it would suck and be <laughs> terrible. And y'all just are kind of like the seasoning and the flavor that, you know, inspire me that much more to have this to create this life that I live and seeing all of my friends and the people that I love grow and pour into themselves and achieve like y'all have no idea how that fills my cup okay and then for the uh, question of the week for us and for listeners I'm gonna use one that I didn't ask you yet what's one of the most special ways you've been shown that you're loved oh man oh that's a good one that is kind of like yeah think about it <laughs> one of those that where you, even if you say something later, you might think of something else. But, exactly. But what's one one of uh, the most special ways you've been shown that you're loved? Oh, man. Um, 
I think, oh, yeah, this, I'm like, man, I'm going to think of a, a good one later. But I, the first one that popped up is people who know me and know, like, where I want to go and my goals and my mm-hmm. heart and all that stuff and know, like, my journey about, like, learning to love myself and care about myself. Like, they, them giving me thoughtful things to help me get to where I need to be, stuff I might not have even seen mm-hmm. or noticed yet. And it's little things like um, sending me, like when I first started doing like my fitness and meal prep videos, like sending me a tripod, like for my mm-hmm. phone, like things like that, like sending me useful things. Mm-hmm, yeah. That, but also even like Venmo me thirty dollars and be like, hey, like go take mm-hmm. yourself on a date, like just mm-hmm. enjoy, relax, like take some time for yourself because they know that that's something I struggle with. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so things like that, just th- really thoughtful, thoughtful gifts. Um, that's good. Uh, for me. Uh, mine's kind of similar, but um, one of the most special ways that I've been shown that I'm loved, I would say, is from my dad when I would go home, and at, like as an adult going home, and I could pull into the driveway or whatever, or he could be coming back to the house, and he will get like give me a flower. One time I remember, like he gave mm-hmm. me a flower, and he's like, "Here, you know, I love you," and because he's so super lovey, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, thank you," but. For me, the fact that it's just like that one flower, because it's not about it being real extra, but that while he was out and about, any anybody if they're like while they're living their life, they took a moment to think about you and then to do something. So similar to kind of yeah. what you're saying, but it's little things like that are, I think, what stick to me as far as like, wow, that really made me feel loved. Yeah, and like just it's still, it's always the little things about like my friends knowing that like. Like, if I'm having a bad day, like, I need a hug, and they might not be huggers. Like, mm-hmm. they will hug me because mm-hmm. they know that that's my love language, and I appreciate that. Like, very thoughtful, simple mm-hmm. things, but where I, I can tell that you listen and you know me. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. So, we're going to uh, end this Carly interview on that. Thank you for joining Alexia's Couch. <laughs> um, I need a better alliteration. Alexia's yeah. Attic or some bullshit. That's <laughs> creepy. <laughs> that did sound creepy as hell. Scratch, scratch that. Um, I'll think about it some more. <laughs> Alexia's Ultima. <laughs> Set it up in the car or something. I don't know. No, you said attic. You stuck with that now. <laughs> Alexia's attic. You got to say it like that. <laughs> Welcome to the attic. <laughs> um, I'm going to leave all that in there. Again, we you keep should. getting stupid at the end, so hopefully nobody <laughs> makes it that far. Um, <laughs> but if y'all do, shout out to y'all. <laughs> leave us a review. Oh, and if you want to ask me any questions, nobody's listening anymore. But if you want to ask me any questions, let me know. Yeah, ask Carly questions this week. Hit her up yeah. on the story. She's going to answer them things. Put um at, what's your Instagram? At Carly Carpio? No, at CC Fierce. Fierce is your Instagram. So her Instagram is CC Fierce. Or I guess they want to uh, tweet you Carly Carpio too. But um, ask questions via like story, whatever. Use... um. Use our hashtag for Carly's Couch or the at Carly's Couch so we can like see it too. Yep, yep. Um, and she'll be happy to answer all your questions as long as they're not wild. I'm gonna say, yeah, don't get out of pocket, fam. Because I'm nice. That's a misconception. She's gonna answer. Me. You might as well ask. <laughs> She's gonna answer it. See, you didn't ask me the like, misconception. Will you bust it open for? <laughs> She's gonna like, uh. Wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> right. She's gonna answer it though. Um, <laughs> that's it. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you have any other topic ideas, these were, again, just like you guys getting to know us even more, us getting to know each other more. Um, and sometimes I think it's cool just for us to explore our own journeys because our topics that we usually have are, you know, relevant to what we're thinking about and what we're doing in our lives. But, um, you know, for us to have our own time to re- like reflect on what's made us who we are and stuff, I think it's still important. it's like you get interviewed and then you're still like, uh, like, you know, what are those answers? Yeah. Um, So, yeah, thank you guys for joining us. See you next week. Adios.